Okay, good afternoon. Good to see all of you. I hope you're having a good day so far. This Thursday afternoon, we're going to do a couple of Rashi's from the fifth Aliyah of this week's Parsha of Vayigash. We're, they're short Rashi's, but they all fit together in terms of a little bit of a package of understanding a couple of Sukkim at the beginning of our Aliyah, which I think are really interesting. In our Aliyah, we see the descent of uh, Yaakov down to Mitzrayim in order to go see Yosef. And this, of course, begins the Gullus. This begins the exile uh, into Egypt and a uh, whole complicated understanding of how that process occurs. But uh, in these psuke, we see very clearly that Yaakov is afraid of something and Hashem consoles him. So it says, They're on their way outside, out of Israel, and they stop at Be'er Sheva. And he sacrifices things to his father, Yitzchak. And uh, it's an interesting phrasing of who he's sacrificing to. Uh, oftentimes when the Avos made sacrifices, it would say that they're sacrificing to the God of their father X, their grandfather this, uh, or in the case of Yitzchak, it would say, La Eloke Avi, Eloke Avraham, Aviv Avraham. Uh, but over here, of course, the God is a, a tr- double God. It's the God of Yitzchak, his father. It's the God of Avraham, his grandfather, right? There's two generations of Mesorah now. When it came to y- y- Yitzchak, the fact that it says he was giving a sacrifice to his, the God of his father, Avraham, that made perfect sense. Um, but over here, it could have really attributed to Eloke Aviv Yitzchak or Yitzchak and Avraham. So the Rashi points out the reason why only Yitzchak is singled out over here. It says, Chayad, Chayav Adam v'chvod Aviv yoter mikvod zekeno. L'fikach tala b'Yitzchak v'lo Avraham. Uh, it's in order that we shouldn't assume that the honor due to a parent and a grandparent is of equal status. Very interesting. If it had said, Eloke Aviv Yitzchak Avraham or something like that, then we would have assumed that the reason it's attributing the name of his God to his father and his grandfather is because he, he owes a certain debt of gratitude or honor to his father and grandfather for discovering this God. But the honor really due to a father and a grandfather or a grandmother and a, gra- a mother and a grandmother is not necessarily of equal weight. There is a mitzvah, there is a sort of uh, extension of kibbutz av that goes to Kibud Zakeno that uh, uh, requires us to honor our grandparents, but not in the same way as our parents. So there is a hierarchy there. They're not of equal status. And therefore, uh, the Torah teaches us that lesson by just calling it Aviv Yitzchak in this case. Then Hashem, after he makes the overture, Yaakov makes the overture, he's clearly facing something traumatic. He's facing something scary. He's facing something precarious, which is why he's reaching out to Hashem in tefillah. Right? That's why he reaches out to Hashem in order to pray for something. So Hashem comes to him and he says, uh, he comes to him, B'maroz talayla, Vayomer Yaakov, Yaakov. He calls him twice, Vayomer Hineni. And he says, here I am. So Rashi points out again, as he does elsewhere, that Yaakov, Yaakov, that double language of calling out is Lashem Chiba. It's a language of love. It's a language of closeness. One calling out Yaakov is more like a commanding voice. Yaakov, Yaakov, it's a, it's a language of love. Hashem is reaching out to him in a loving way, probably because he intuits that he's afraid of something, which is why he's going to console him in the next couple of Sukkim. But in the meantime, as he calls out in that loving tone, Yaakov responds with the word Hineni. I just want to go back to this word Hineni, which we've come to a number of different times already. Rashi doesn't explain Hineni over here, but he does a number of other places, including by the Akeda, where we saw it most pronounced. Uh, Hineni is Lashon Anava Vizrizos. That's what Rashi said in those other places. Anytime God comes to one of the Avos, in the case of the Akedah, it was Avraham, and he says, Avraham, Avraham, same double language. It's Lashon Chiba. It's a language of love. It's an overture for a moment of closeness. The response is always Hineni, which plainly means here I am. But Rashi says it's more than here I am. It's Lashon Anava Vizrizos. It's the language of humility and alacrity. And we explain many times the relationship between humility and alacrity. Alacrity for something that someone else is asking you to do requires a measure of humility. It requires you to limit yourself and to say, hey, I have my own biases. I have my own interests. I have my own hangups. I have my own you know, uh, luxuries that I like to take advantage. I'm going to put that all aside for the sake of going all in on this thing that someone else is asking me to do. You have to shrink yourself to make room for the mission that the other person is implanting upon you. So the response to an overture of love, to a desire of a relationship is hineni. 
humility. The ability to shrink yourself to make room for the other is the appropriate response to an overture of Lashon Chiva. That's why these two fit together, Yaakov, Yaakov, and Hineni. Rashi doesn't say the Hineni here, but we can connect it back to other Rashis. We learn, realizing why this Hineni is always a response to the double calling out, Abraham, Abraham, Yaakov, Yaakov, uh, like we see over here. Okay, then of course we see in Pasuk Gimel, Vayomer, Anochi Akelope Avicha, I'm the God of your father, Al Tirame Da Mitzrayim. Don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. From the fact that God is consoling him, telling him not to be afraid, we understand what's going on in all the Psukim that preceded it. We understand why he stops in Beersheba. We understand why, um, why he davens, why he builds a Mizbeah, why he's offering a, a sacrifice, why he's reaching out to Hashem and someone, what he's afraid of in this moment. He's afraid of going down to Mitzrayim. And there could be many layers to that fear. But the one Rashi points to is, The one fear Rashi points to here is not the fear of the journey. It's not the fear of uh, what's going to happen when he sees Yosef. It's not the fear of the culture of Egypt. It's not the fear of any of those things. It's not the fear of losing his family. It's the fear of leaving Eretz Yisrael. He was so connected. And he knew what it was like to leave. He knew what it was like to be distanced from his land for 20 something years. He felt that pain and he finally came back and reattached himself to the land. He's dreadfully afraid of leaving, especially because prophetically he knows that this is for the long haul. This is for two, three, 400 years that they're gonna be out of Israel. He understands that that connection is going to be lost and he's very afraid. So Hashem says, don't worry. And you know, it's easy to say, don't worry. We have to back it up with something, right? Uh, so he backs it up with a number of things. Number one, don't worry, your family is going to continue. Number two, number two, I'm going to go with you there, so you don't have to be afraid. And three, I'm also going to take you out. That's the real clincher. If you're afraid of going down there, of losing your connection, you're right. There may be a temporary loss of connection, but my promise to you, says Hashem, is that will only be temporary because Anochi Gamalo, I am going to take you out of there and by implication bring you back to the land of Canaan. So if your fear is Nizkak, let's say the Chutzlaret, your fear is of leaving the land of Israel and going to Chutzlaret, I'm promising you that you could mitigate your fear a little bit. I can't get rid of it because you're right, you have to leave and that's a difficult and painful thing, but I can mitigate that fear a little bit by promising you that I'll be with you. So some of the spirituality you lose from leaving the land will be made up because I'll be with you. And I can promise you that the, te- that the disconnect will only be temporary because you will make it back. Now Rashi points out, of course, Yaakov doesn't make it back alive, but he does make it back dead. He's at least going to be buried there. But I don't think the implication here was specifically to Yaakov. I think it was about his descendants eventually coming back uh, to that land to restore the connection that Yaakov once lost. Much more to say about this subject, even in the midst of these tzokim, but uh, we'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Have a nice day. Have a good day. Have a good one.